We begin with the man President-elect Biden has chosen to be his White House Chief of Staff, Ron Klain. Ron, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, you know, the President-elect has, has, has seemed bemused by President Trump's refusal to concede. Your colleague Bob Bauer has called Trump's actions very harmful to democratic process. How much damage has the president done? How much damage can he do? Well, I think he has definitely set back uh, the democratic norm here in the United States. He's been doing that for four years, and that's ramped up since the election. You know, he couldn't really run on his record. Uh, the voters rejected his leadership. A record number of Americans rejected the Trump presidency. And since then, he, Donald Trump's been rejecting democracy. He's been, as you, as you said at the outset, uh, launching baseless claims of voter fraud, uh, baseless litigation. He's been rejected by 34 courts. And now these efforts to try to get election officials to overturn the will of the voters. It's corrosive. It's harmful. But uh, as Mitt Romney said, it's not going to change the outcome of what happens here. At 12 noon on January 20th, Joe Biden will become the next president of the United States. Uh, everything Donald Trump's doing now is bad for our democracy. It's bad for uh, our, our position, our image in the world, but it's not going to change what happens here when we get a new president next year. As you know, a Monmouth poll out Wednesday showed that 70 percent of Republicans believe that Biden won because of voter fraud. Are you worried that the president is trying to lock in a perception by his base that Biden is an illegitimate president? And can this work? Well, George, as you know, that same poll showed that an overwhelming number of Americans as a whole thought that the election was fair and proper and Joe Biden was the rightful winner. We know we have to reach out to Republicans. We know we have to bring the country together. In fact, that's been the entire essence of Joe Biden's campaign for the presidency, trying to heal this nation, repair its soul, restore its backbone, uh, unite the country. And uniting the country is what he's doing. Look, look at what he did this past week, George. He met with business and labor leaders together to talk about fixing the economy. Military leaders who served in both Democratic and Republican administrations to talk about our national security future. And then he met with governors, both Democrats and Republicans, including some conservative Republican governors, to talk about the urgent needs of fighting COVID. So he's doing his job of bringing the country together. Donald Trump's never going to change. He spent four years tearing this country apart. It seems he's determined to spend the final days of his presidency doing the same thing. One person the president elected not me with is Mitch McConnell, the Senate Republican leader. After that Pennsylvania court decision last night, Republican Senator Pat Toomey had this to say. He said President Trump should accept the outcome of the election and facilitate the presidential transition process. Is it time for Mitch McConnell and other GOP leaders to do the same? I, I hope they would. I hope they would start to accept the reality here. I was encouraged this week, George, to see, in addition to the statement from Senator Romney and last night's statement, from Senator Toomey was reporting that many Senate Republicans are talking about confirming Joe Biden's nominees in the regular order and trying to get competent, experienced people in the government uh, in confirmed positions, not this whole acting mess we've had in the past. So I think we're seeing some encouraging signs. Look, Washington will always be the last place to change. What I saw this week with the president-elect's interactions with leaders from around the country is that outside of Washington, Democrats and Republicans are looking forward to what happens on January 20th. They want to work together to get things done. Uh, now we have to get the job here and done here in D.C. As a practical matter, your transition is challenged until the GSA ascertains a winner. You know, the president's warned, president president-elect has warned that continued delay could actually cost American lives. What options do you have if the GSA continues to block the transition? Yeah, George, you know, there's obviously parts of the transition that are in our control. We're picking people to work in the White House and to work in the cabinet. We're uh, building our policy plans. We're, uh, you know, having high-level meetings with uh, leaders from around the country. And so there's parts of the transition that are proceeding apace and, in fact, proceeding at record-setting pace. But as you note, there are other parts that are not in our control. Uh, the president-elect, the vice president-elect are not getting the kind of intelligence briefings they're entitled to. They're not getting... We're not getting, our transition isn't getting access to agency officials to help develop our plans. And there's a lot of focus on that vaccine rollout plan that's going to be critical in the early days of a Biden presidency. We have no access to that. And we're not getting uh, background checks. We're not in a position to get background checks on cabinet nominees. And so there are definite impacts. Those impacts escalate every day. And I hope that the administrator of the GSA will do her job. The law only requires her to find who is the apparent victor of the election. And I can't imagine there's any dispute, any dispute, that Joe Biden is the apparent winner 
of the presidential election. You talked about vaccine distribution. I talked to General Perrineau from Operation Warp Speed on Friday. He said the lack of, of, of communication between his team and the transition isn't delaying distribution at all. Do you buy that? Well, obviously, it doesn't delay distribution while Donald Trump's in charge. But on January 20th, Joe Biden will be in charge. And if there isn't a seamless flow of information now so that we know what we're getting ourselves into, so we know what plans they've made, so we know what gaps there are in the plans, then I do think there's risk that that distribution uh, has gaps and lapses starting on January 20th. You know, I'm sorry, but while I respect many people involved in this effort on the Trump side in terms of the vaccine distribution effort, the fact of the matter is the Trump administration has a history of failure in dealing with the COVID crisis, including a dr dramatic and drastic failure on the testing uh, challenge. And so I think just, you know, if the Trump administration positions were just supposed to trust them that this is all going to work out, I think that's a hard sell to the American people. We have seen that good news on the COVID vaccine, though. Both Pfizer and Moderna on track for emergency use authorization. Should the president in Operation War Speed get any credit for that? Well, I think that uh, everyone involved should get credit for that. Uh, you know, the, it starts most importantly with the scientists, the brilliant men and women who've done this work. But, George, vaccines don't save lives. Vaccinations save lives. And so the scientific work that's been done to get this vaccine to the place where it can be approved by the FDA, hopefully very, very soon, is just the first step. The much bigger step is actually getting those vaccinations to the American people. That's hard. Look, the Trump administration has been at this for eight or nine months. In the course of that, fewer than one in three Americans has gotten a COVID test. And so now the question is, how can we get 100 percent of Americans a vaccine in short order? And that is a challenge that I think uh, the American people are right to be skeptical about in terms of the way in which the Trump administration would handle it. And uh, that's a challenge that is going to largely fall on the Biden administration. The sooner we can get briefed on those plans, the sooner we can get our experts in with their experts, I think the more confidence everyone can have that those plans will proceed apace in 2021. Given the continued surge in COVID, should we expect anything like a normal inauguration? No, George, I think it's going to definitely have to be changed. Uh, we started some consultations with uh, House and Senate leadership on that. Uh, obviously, this is not going to be the same kind of inauguration we've had in the past. You know, George, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris conducted this campaign with the safety of the American people in mind. They got a lot of grief for that. They got uh, attacked from that relentlessly by President Trump for the way in which they campaigned safely to try to prevent the spread of the disease. Uh, they're going to try to have an inauguration that honors the importance and the symbolic meaning of the moment, but also does not uh, result in spread of the disease. That's our goal. So what does that mean? No parades, no big crowd on the mall, no big lunch inside the rotunda? Well, George, well, I'm going to let those plans unfold in consultation with the folks in the Capitol who organized that, with the experts who planned that. Uh, you know, we ran a very effective and I think engaging a Democratic convention this year in August in a way that uh, was safe for the people to participate and watch it, in a way that communicate with the American people. Uh, you know, I think we'll have some mix of those techniques, some mix of, uh, you know, scaled down versions of the existing traditions. People have a lot to celebrate on January 20th. I mean, we saw the day that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris were announced as president and vice president of the United States. People all over the world, and particularly in America, dancing in the streets. We know people want to celebrate. There is something here to celebrate. We just want to try to find a way to do it as safely as possible. Uh, meantime, the clock is ticking on the economic relief package. A lot of programs, including unemployment, expire on December 31st. I know the president-elect wants to pass a relief package now. Is he willing to endorse a far smaller package than Democrats have passed in the past, focused just on extending unemployment benefits? And what's your reaction to Treasury Secretary Mnuchin allowing the other Fed lending programs to expire? Well, so first, uh, as you know, George, uh, the president-elect, the vice president-elect met face-to-face uh, -face in Wilmington uh, on Friday with uh, the leader Schumer and Speaker Pelosi to talk about the best way to get that relief done. Uh, they're on point for negotiating this package, and uh, the president-elect said that he will uh, support uh, the best outcome they can achieve in these negotiations. Uh, I am very concerned. I think the president-elect's very concerned that we're at a real crisis in many households in this country right now as you said, unemployment insurance runs out many, for many people 
at the end of the year, before Joe Biden takes office. Uh, the eviction moratorium runs out at the end of the year before Joe Biden takes office. So if that and other problems are going to be fixed, they have to be fixed right now uh, under the Trump presidency uh, with the congressional lineup we have right now. And I think the president-elect is going to do whatever he can to be supportive of that outcome. Uh, I think it's a shame that Secretary Mnuchin did what he did with regard to these unexpended relief uh, uh, funds that were made available by the Congress um, and, uh, you know, worked through the Federal Reserve. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, it obviously raises the challenges that we're going to face when we take over on January 20th. Senate control is still up for grabs. As you know, Democrats will have to win both runoffs in Georgia to take control of the Senate. Here's what the president-elect told me about the importance of Senate control back in February. I think I'm more ready to be able to defeat Donald Trump and equally importantly, George, elect a Democratic Senate. It's not going to be enough just to beat him. We have to change the Senate in order to get things done. Wasn't he right then? You know, one former Obama official told Dan Balls of the Washington Post, it's the difference between having a transformational presidency versus having to no negotiate everything with a Republican Senate. Well, winning those two Senate seats in Georgia is important, and we're going to do everything we can to help those two candidates, great candidates in Georgia, help them win. We've already moved people who were working uh, on the Biden campaign on the recounts down there over to be supportive in the field work for our two candidates down there. And I expect you'll see the president-elect travel down there before Election Day. So it's very, very important to win those seats. The thing, the reality, of course, George, is that even if we win them both, and I think we will win them both, I think both candidates are doing a great job, we're going to have a closely divided Senate kind of under any scenario. And I think uh, one challenge that the president-elect has taken on is trying to work with members of both parties to build consensus for action on things like economic relief, uh, like climate change, like dealing with our uh, other crises, our racism crisis, the challenge of fixing our immigration laws, uh, and of course, obviously, fighting COVID. So uh, we're going to have a closely divided Senate, whatever happens in Georgia. Obviously, we want to win those seats. Uh, I really want to see Chuck Schumer be the next majority leader in the U.S. Senate. Uh, I, I think he and the president-elect have a great relationship, but um, I know they have a great relationship. Uh, but however that comes out, we are going to deliver for the American people. And that's the mission. Look, I think that voters sent a clear sign in 2020. And the sign they sent was they want to see things get done. They want action on COVID, the economy, climate, health care, bringing down health care costs. They want to see action on all of that. We're going to deal with whatever lineup we're faced with in Washington to get that done. It would be better if that lineup was a Democratic Senate. But if unfortunately, and I think I don't think this will happen, but if we were to lose those seats in Georgia, we're going to move forward with whatever Senate gets elected. There's going to be some tension between getting unity, getting things done, working with Republicans and investigating any wrongdoing that occurred during the Trump administration. Now, the vice president has been reported has expressed a preference that he doesn't want his presidency consumed by Trump investigations. Uh, that has raised some concerns about among some Democrats, including Congressman Bill Pascrell, who had this to say this week. Failure to hold financial and political wrongdoing accountable in the past has invited greater malfeasance by bad actors. A repeat of those failures in 2021 further emboldens criminality by our national leaders and continues America down the path of lawlessness and authoritarianism. There must be accountability. How do you balance moving forward with getting accountability? Well, let's be clear, George. The president-elect spoke about this many times during the campaign. And what he made it clear is that Joe Biden is not going to tell the Justice Department who to investigate or who not to investigate. That's what we saw the past four years, the president tampering with the Justice Department, egging on investigations, so on and so forth. He's going to pick an excellent attorney general, an independent Justice Department, and that department will make decisions independently, free of politics, free of political favor in either direction as to how to enforce the laws. That's the way it should be. That's the way it's always been. That's the way it needs to be if we're going to have the kind of rule of law that's so important in our country. Are we going to see an attorney general, State Department, or Treasury pick this week? <laughs> well, what I can confirm, George, is that you're going to see the first of the president-elect's cabinet appointments on Tuesday of this week, uh, meeting the pace, uh, beating, in fact, the pace that was set by the Obama-Biden transition, uh, beating the pace set by the Trump transition. Uh, so you're going to see the first cabinet picks this Tuesday. But if you want to know what cabinet agencies they are, or who's going to be in those cabinet agencies, you'll have to wait for the president-elect to say that uh, himself on Tuesday. I knew you were going to tell me who it was. I was hoping you might tell me which ones it was. <laughs> but thank you. We'll be watching on Tuesday, uh, Ron Klain. We want people to tune in, George.
<laughs> okay, thanks, thanks very George. much. Appreciate it. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.